Uh, so uh, today <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh, what are we talking about? Financial forecasting. That's what we're talking about. And the reason is because next week you're going to have a case on cash budgeting, and the question is explicitly how large a credit line should this clinic seek from its bank? And again, this is a very practical question. Uh, I deal with this as treasurer uh, every year. Uh, regularly on a regular basis because it has real financial consequences to the organization. So in keeping with my policy of trying to tell you what part of the chapter is, uh, you'll see in the real world what part you won't. Uh, the, 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 um, the content that we're going to talk about today on the percentage of, uh, of uh, revenue, the, the constant growth model that we're going to use uh, to uh, project financial statements. Uh, you will not be asked to do that kind of analysis in the real world, but that the, the concepts that we're going to talk about are the con are the basis of the financial planning forecasting software that you will use. So uh, my objective here is instead of having you just use the for the software without having a clue as to where these numbers are coming from, we will go through the concepts and that will help you understand that when you use forecasting software that there is a logic and a financial uh, a framework that goes into those numbers. Uh, the second part we're going to talk about is cash budgeting, and this you will see in the real world. They are very, it is a very practical tool, as in not only in your professional careers, but also in your personal lives. Cash budgeting is something that uh, anybody who has an income uh, generally does because you want to make sure your cash inflows are greater than your cash outflows. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so <clears throat> all the financial planning, all the financial forecasting comes from, it, it's not done in isolation, it's done as part of the strategic planning process that most healthcare organizations go through. And again, I'm not going to go all through this because I'm sure you've covered it in your, your behavior classes, the mission statement, goals and objectives and so on. So the financial plan, tends to be a subset of the operating plan. And these are usually done for three to five years. Uh, in times of high uncertainty, lots of uh, uh, changes going on, and it's sort of like right now where there's health reform and care organizations and so on. Uh, Three-year plans tend to be more typical when, when there's a lot of change going on. So the for financial forecast essentially has the following kinds of things. You look at what's happening right now, you put together a capital budget, a cash budget, pro forma financial statements, and pro forma simply is Latin for meaning something, I don't know what it means, but it means in the future. Like, <laughs> it sounds like it means in the future anyway. I never actually had someone, a Latin scholar, translate that, but uh, I think... <laughs> well, we have one in our midst. Okay, what does it mean? means for the sake of, and in this case, forma, forma literally does mean form or shape, um, and so we can translate it as being for the, for the foreseeable future. So. Okay. See, that's A plus on the Latin. That's great. <laughs> Tonight, Brian will be on the phone to his parents saying, you see that Latin degree really paid off. <laughs> so that's good. That's never happened to me before. That's, that's, that's an educational first for me. Yeah. So that's what it means for the future, for the foreseeable future. The external financing plan is where uh, identifying what capital, what uh, financing we're going to need and where we're going to get it from. And then projected financial condition analysis is, is generally ten, tends to be financial ratios. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all these. This is sort of the process that, that most healthcare organizations will have to produce the financial plan. So how do we actually create these financial statements? Well, uh, we, there are different techniques. And we're going to talk about the constant growth or the percentage of sales method. We, and we then t those, those are tied to revenues, and then as, as the revenues change, we know that the different kinds of relationships will change as well. So 
before we do this, where do where do you think, who do you think in a healthcare organization is among the best people to talk to for information about what's going about pro forma financial statements? So what's going to happen in the future? What assumptions you need to make for the financial? If you go to a nursing unit, who's one of the most knowledgeable people in the nursing unit? Sorry? The charge nurse, the unit clerk, they know what's going on. They know how many times a day Dr. Smith walks in and out. They know what jo Dr. Jones' patients look like. They know whether the average of patient acuity is going up or going down. They know whether the, uh, the kinds of drugs that are being ordered for the patients are changing or not. They know a lot. And so I strongly urge you, when you get into your middle management positions that you will be in in the next few years, to talk to those frontline staff. They are extremely knowledgeable. They will give you good information, and they will help you avoid forecasting errors. One of the smartest people, uh, one of the most smartest CEOs I ever met was one of my MHA classmates. Uh, you know, 20 years from now, you know, you'll be saying this about each other as well. You know? Vic will be saying that Taylor, she is so smart that she, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's what at least that's what I'm doing right now. One of my one of my classmates is the CEO of a large academic medical center, and I had lunch with him one day. <clears throat> I'm just sitting in his office, and we're about to get up and go to lunch, and the door flies open, and the chief of obstetrics comes in, hands waving in the air. I can't work with these people, <laughs> and so I said, she, my. Classmate says, well, what's, what's the issue? And he said, well, we're, we, I've got to produce this forecast of obstetrics volume and revenues and expenses, and all these bozos I'm working with that nobody can agree on anything. We, nobody, it's just total chaos. So my classmate said to this guy, you know, I have to try to get some more details and so on. Anyway, he talked to him about 10, 15 minutes, and finally he said to him, my classmate said to the chief, I'll do your budget. I'll do the forecast for you. No problem. But I want you to know that you're turning the task over to the least qualified person in the hospital. And that to me was extremely smart because essentially there's no way a CEO can have any understanding of how things, the day-to-day -day clinical reality of every single nursing unit in, their, in, the, in his or her hospital. You gotta rely on the frontline staff. So, we're going to talk about the uh, percentage of revenue approach, and we're going to talk, we'll use this uh, simple example of some financial statements. So what happens when you use financial forecasting software is it will ask you for a whole bunch of data as, that it will use as inputs. And so it'll ask you for the balance sheet. It'll ask you for the income statement. <clears throat> it'll ask you for assumptions about the rate of inflation. It'll ask you for assumptions about a payer mix and so on. You put all this data in and then you push a button and poof, out come all these forecasted financial statements. So let's, how does it do this? Well, let, we'll talk about that. So here's a typical balance sheet uh, of uh, a for-profit healthcare provider. Here's a typical income statement. The revenues, variable costs, and so on. So the constant growth model, m method essentially takes these accounts and it ties them to revenues. Because as revenues go up, expenses go up, a lot of balance sheet items go up, your, the amount of cash you have goes up, the amount of inventories you tend to have goes up. A lot of these things tend to be affected by revenues. That's the basic assumption of the model. Some are not directly tied to revenues. Debt, interest expense, dividends, and retained earnings, which depends on the amount of dividends. So the, the key in these models, then, is you input all these data. So we're, for this simple example, we're going to assume there's going to be a 25% increase in revenues next year. Uh, interest rate on the debt is 8%. The tax rate's 40. Dividend pay rate ratio is 30, and so on. And we're going to assume for now a percent of capacity 100%. In other words, uh, there is no excess capacity. 
So the first thing it does is that here's the 2010 income statement on the far left-hand column. We're going to grow it by 25% because that's the expected increase in revenues. So next year, our, the, uh, we're projecting as the first pass that the revenues will be 2.5 million, which is 500,000 greater than the 2 million last year. Ex as variable costs will grow and fixed costs will grow by exactly the same amount. And right for now, we've got interest expense of 16 million, but we're just going to 16,000. We're going to just carry that over to the far right-hand column because we're still on the first pass. The, the balance sheet, the assets, uh, because we're going to have 25% more patients, more revenue, we're going to have probably 25% more cash, 25% more accounts receivable and inventory. So our total current assets grows from 500,000 to 625,000. On the claim side, we can see accounts payable and accruals, that's likely to increase as 20, by 25% as well. Notes payable, we're just going to carry across to the right-hand column for now because that's how we're going to be financing any sh cash shortfalls. So that's sort of a plug variable for now. Long-term debt won't change. Common stock won't change. Retained earnings will change because the 46 comes from the first pass the income statement. So if we go back, there's the 46 at the bottom left on the bottom uh, middle column. There's the 46. That gets bad, added in over here. So the retained earnings goes from 200 to 246. So that's the first pass. And what happens is we have find that we've got forecasted total assets of 1.25 million, and we've got forecasted liabilities of 1.071. So after the first pass, the computer says, okay, we need $179,000 in financing. We've got more, our growth in assets is going to require an extra $179,000 to finance that growth. We're going to assume that uh, half of that growth, that half of that 179 is going to be financed by notes payable, and half of it will be financed by long-term debt. And we know that the interest rate is 8%. So now what happens? We do the second pass. So the computer then takes the second pass. Here's the result of the first pass. We're going to add in the $14,000 of interest. Of, that's the 14000 the 8% times the, the, uh, the amount that we're, uh, uh, the, the, 8% times the one, whatever it was, the 179, which gives us total interest now of 30,000. The balance, second pass of the balance sheet doesn't change. And the second pass at the, the liability side, we're going to have the extra 90,000 in notes payable, the extra 89,000 long-term debt, and retained earnings goes down by minus six. And again, that happens because of that six right there, the shortfall. So now what happens? Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. The second pass results, you can see that the actual shortfall now has collapsed. So the computer continues to do this iteratively until there's no shortfall uh, left. And what that information then that gives management is that it tells you the, the, the amount of the external financing requirement. We're going to need this amount of money to raise in order to finance the growth, the 25% growth we're going to have in revenues and patient volume this year. We're going to need to raise this additional capital. Yeah? So where should the minus 600 be It used to be, where's retainer? Hold on. I've got the answer to that. Okay, there's the 46. So your, your question is where does the minus 6 come from? And that comes from 46 to 4 on slide 16, which is... 46 minus 40 at the bottom. After the first pass, it's 46. After the second pass, it's 40. So it's a $6,000 reduction. So that is essentially what the financial forecasting models are doing. They're producing forecasted income statements and, the, and the, an estimate of what the external financing requirement is going to be. 
So the question is, is well, okay, now we know it's 170,000 or so that we're going to need. What kinds of factors will influence how large that's going to be? And I claim, Lou Kapensky claims there are six different factors that are going to affect that. Revenue growth rate. How will that affect the amount of money that a healthcare organization will have to raise to finance its growth? So if you've got a, let's suppose you've got a low revenue growth rate, will that be associated with a higher or a lower amount of external firing requirement? Lower. If your volume is growing very slowly, the amount of money that you're going to need to finance that growth is going to be less. So the lower your revenue growth rate, the lower the external financing requirement. What about capacity utilization? If you've got excess capacity, what do you think that implies for the amount of money you're going to have to raise? Less, because you won't have to, you'll be able to absorb a lot of the increase in, in the volume with your current capacity. If you've got a, an, an occupancy rate of 50% and you're projecting a 10% increase in volume, you can probably absorb that within the current complements of beds that you've got. So the lower the capacity utilization, the less the external financing requirement. Capital intensity, what does that mean? What's the relationship to the external financing requirement? What's an example of an organization that's highly capital intensive? Now, capital is capital, buildings and equipment. So high buildings, low service? What's, an, what's a healthcare service or organization that needs a lot of buildings and equipments to provide its services? Radiology? Yeah, well, cancer is a, is a good example. Cancer hospitals have got all kinds of machines and buildings Home health would probably be the opposite extreme. They have very little capital. They really have nurses and, and aides and people who physically go out to bring capital into the home, as it were. So what is the relationship between the amount of capital that's got to be raised, the external financing requirement, and how capital intensive the organization is? Right, exactly. So if you were at cancer hospital and you want to expand your business by 30 40%, you're going to have to finance that with a lot of capital. If you're a home health agency, you want to expand the number of patients you see by 30 40%, you may not have to do anything. You may, not have, you may have very little external financing requirement. Profitability, what's the relationship between external financing requirement and profitability? But that's right. So if you're highly profitable, that means <clears throat> you've got uh, a growing amount of retained earnings. That can be used to finance uh, the, the external financing requirement. You don't have to go to the external sources as frequently as if you are not profitable. Dividend policy is not obvious. Essentially, that means uh, if you've got a fixed dividend policy, uh, you probably, uh, um, that, that will... Dividend policy is something that you do not want to skip dividends because it's a negative signal to the market. So it really depends on how the level of stickiness around the dividend. If, you, if, it's, if it's really stuck, if it's really uh, uh, sticky, 
then that will reduce, that will increase the amount of external financing requirement you need. If it's elective, like if, if the market is used to you, the organization uh, issuing dividends, not issuing them, issuing them, not issuing them, then that will uh, reduce the external financing requirement. And then finally, the ability to tra attract contribution capital. If you're not for profit, what does that mean? It's like uh, donations or grants. You, you don't attract that and you have to finance that. Exactly. So if you are, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the children's hospital in Texas? St. Jude's, is it? In Texas? Sorry? I think that's one of them. Yeah. 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 So they go on TV every now and then and they, they, they raise money. I mean, there are a lot of hospitals that where somebody where it's, it's real, they have a, a huge donor base, so they have a lot less need for external financing than um, typically uh, inner city kind of hospitals that deal with a high proportion of uninsured.